In John 14, 26, the Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Bible said that, first of all, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. And he also teaches you to the point that he says he will bring the things that you've learned back to your remembrance if you will put them in your heart. In John 16, 13, turn there please. The Bible says, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Bible also says the Holy Spirit will like guide you into all truth, everybody. He will not guide you into some truth, not a little bit of truth, not halfway truth, but all truth. And the Bible said he would show you things to come. Not only will he show you future events, he will show you things to come when you're out there witnessing. He's going to show you what people can become through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I would urge you today that as we look at this as we're about to pray that we claim this promise that the Holy Spirit will teach us and show us things to come. Let us bow our heads now. Father in heaven, you have given us a commission that is not by might nor by power but by thy spirit that men and women, children are convicted of the message of these last days. And so, Lord, we ask a very special blessing that you will take control of our minds, that you will shape our will, and that the Holy Spirit can have his way in our minds and hearts as we study and as we talk today and as the message is brought forth about time be no more. Lord, we thank you for your blessings and for your mercy. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I want to say to you that you've heard all type of messages during this winter convocation. And some of you are full and fat with information. Uh, but like the two leopards who made up their minds one day, they said, we will go over to the Assyrian camp and perhaps we could obtain some food by them. And if they kill us, they kill us because we starve. And those two lepers went in the camp and they found that the Assyrians had been conquered by holy angels. And they found the food and the spoil all in the tents of the Assyrians. They saw the swords and the shields and they were eating and they got full and they said what we're doing is not right our brothers and our sisters are starving in Jerusalem there are famine conditions in Jerusalem we will go back and bring a report and just before that happened the Bible had told the day before a prophet stood up and told the king tomorrow there'll be a bushel of barley for a nickel of barley Tomorrow, there'll be bread to throw away. And one of the men stood up, one of the guards stood up and said, Sire, this man is, 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 is impossible to believe him. And the prophet told him, you shall see it, but you shall not have it. And that day, when the lepers came back the next day and began to give their report and told the people about the food, the people were so hungry, they were so excited, that the king told that doubting guard to open the gate 
And when he opened the gate, the people stampeded the gate, trampled the guard who doubted, and they went to the Syrian camp and they ate. All because two sickly and feeble leopards made up their mind that they would share the spoil with their brothers and sisters. What is a little story? But in Revelation 14, 6, go with me there. We're going to talk to you today, and I'm going to share experience with you in call Porter work. But I want to tell you who this angel is of Revelation 14, 6. Some of you already know. Some of you are Revelation seminar, Daniel Revelation seminar, Bible studies, extraordinaires. You know what I'm talking about. But I want to share this with you today. And I want you to look at this verse carefully. In Revelation 14, 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that right now because I want to talk about the angel. According to, according to present truth messages, this angel represents God's people. It represents all of us who have the three angels' messages. It represents us having a relationship with Christ and being clothed in Christ and his righteousness. And we are told that when we have received the Christ and his righteousness, we are to go ye therefore and teach all nations. This angel of Revelation 14, the Bible says, John said, I saw another angel. And he says, he, had, he says, having, the word having in this text, it refers to one in possession of something. He is not just having a knowledge of the Bible. That's not good enough. He doesn't just have a knowledge of the spirit of prophecy. This angel does not go on one side only quoting the spirit of prophecy and never studying the Bible. And this angel doesn't go always just quoting the Bible and denying the spirit of prophecy. This angel of Revelation 14, 6 is one who the Bible says have him. The word have him means he's in possession of what? The everlasting gospel. Now what is the everlasting gospel? Huh? Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. What does this angel have? What does this messenger have in his life? It's not just in his bag. It's not just some manuscript he studied. It is in his life. He has the everlasting gospel. He has the power of God unto salvation in his life, ladies and gentlemen. It is the power that he possesses. When he opens his mouth, people are convicted. When he walks down the street, the people say, don't mess with that guy. That man is, the, is with the Lord. Uh, that people take note that this man has been with Jesus. The love of God flows through his heart like, like nobody's business. He's always not only kind and he's not just tolerant. He really loves people and he hates iniquity, but he loves the truth. And he carries the truth from door to door. He carries it in sermons and he carries it on his job. He is, it is a living epistle. Everybody on the job knows this man. They know what he believes and they know what he's about. Uh, this angel of revelation, this man is, this angel is one who has understood that he lives in the time of the investigative judgment and so he is justified by faith in Christ alone. Faith in his atoning sacrifice on Calvary and faith in the final atoning work that's going on in the heavenly sanctuary above. This man is justified by faith, therefore he goes with a clean life. He is not covered in his own legalism. He is covered by Christ's righteousness. Like Joshua, this angel stands before the Lord saying, I am undone. I am filthy. I'm, I'm unclean, Lord. I am a sinner, and I realize I'm only saved by the grace and power of Christ and Christ alone. Not only that, but this angel of Revelation 14, 6 is one who is justified, but he is also sanctified. John 17, 17 is his motto. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He doesn't miss a day of prayer and Bible study. This angel has a living connection with God. This angel walks with God, talks with God, confesses his sins on a daily basis, makes it right with his brother. He reconciles wherever he has a problem. He gets it right so he can go to God on his knees and go to sleep in peace. He doesn't take anything for granted. For this angel understands that he is wrestling with the devil and all the host of hell. Who is this angel of Revelation 
14, 6. I hope this angel is you. I hope that you will take into account that this angel has received the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ and he is covered. And Ellen White says that the righteousness of Christ, the 1888 message, remember that? She's, yeah, y'all remember that, don't you? It shouldn't be just, we remember, it should be in our lives by now, amen? amen. 1888 ought to be not only a historical uh, memorial, but it ought to be in our lives. We ought to be 1888. We ought to be preparing now to receive the latter rain because the early rain is transformed thy characters. Amen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But she says that the righteous of Christ is the third angel's message in verity. This angel is possessing the righteous of Christ, the power of God unto salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, and so that means when he goes out and does his missionary work, he has power. That means when he goes in on prayer and he goes in the hospitals and intercede, he can expect God to answer because he goes to God on a daily basis and he can walk in the hospitals and pray for the AIDS victims and they can recover. Oh, wait a minute now, because this angel has the message of Elijah. Oh, come on now, are you with me now? Ah, oh, yes, this angel has the message of Elijah. He's praying for the double portion of God's Holy Spirit because he's got the early rain coming, but he works so carefully. He considers his soul need for Christ so much until he doesn't go by without confessing and put away his sins. In fact, this angel will supersede the days of William Miller when they preached and bars, gambling bars, were turned into churches. And yet the Bible says that he has the power of God on the salvation. He has the everlasting gospel. Yes, and this angel will do some witnessing. And where will he witness? To church members who already know the truth? Oh, now that's what we need to do today, right, ladies and gentlemen? We need to work with the church members who already know the truth. We need to constantly be arguing and going back and forth with those who are wrangling over certain little doctrinal points and other errors and heresies. We don't have time for the world. We got to deal with what's in here, correct? Wrong. You're supposed to have a relationship with Jesus that is so constant and so consistent that you have but one object and that's to save your fellow man now the church member that wants to hear the truth and surrender up his error and his heresy God bless him but your duty and your call is to help him stay help him to get straight in the area where he can help you go out there and witness amen, amen? amen. I hope that's what it is some of us get called down in many studies and all type, of, all type of things that keep us bogged down and keep us stagnated and we can't grow and we can't understand why we're still, just st still stumbling over things we should have gotten the victory over because we will not go all the way. How, well, how far will you go with Jesus? Do you deny yourself? Will you pick up your cross? Will you say, Lord, if nobody else go, I will go? And where are you going? To the, to the Adventist organized church and say, well, y'all Babylon, come out, right? If you carry that message, the spirit of prophecy says God has not given you a message. I'm being real with you now. Well, some, for some reason, the devil got us going back to our own people when we're supposed to be out going out there. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. Are you going into all the world and teaching all nations? Matthew 24, 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom. What? This good news of the kingdom. What is the good news? Christ and his righteousness and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world as a witness unto all nations. And then, when God's people of Revelation 14 have carried this message like this, and then when God's people of Revelation 14 are no longer fighting among themselves, and then when God's people have got the error straight and got one thing on their mind, the truth and nothing but the truth, so help them God, then and then shall the end come. Amen. The Seventh-day Adventist church and this message that we have is going to bring this world to an end. Don't you sit here and keep watching the world and nuclear war and United Nations and keep saying they're going to bring it in. No, we got the nuclear bomb. Amen. We got the missiles and the warheads. Amen. And I'm going to tell you about the missiles and the warheads in a few minutes. Oh, yes, they're right here. I got them in my hand. I'm loaded today. I don't know about you, but I'm loaded. I know we got it. Don't sit here and tell me that I'm waiting on Russia to push a button and the world living in fear. The world doesn't need to fear the nuclear bomb. The world better fear the seven last plagues. The world better fear the wrath of God. The world better fear that Jesus is coming again. Oh, yes, this is the nuclear bomb, folks. 
devil and his angels are not worried about those arsenals over in Cuba and Russia and all that kind of stuff. The devil and his angels are worried about the arsenals found in the Adventist church. They're worried about you and I. They're worried about we just might get a glimpse of heaven. We might just get a glimpse that this world is no, not our home. We might desire a better country and we might not be rest satisfied until we carry it out. So the devil and his angels get upset and they say, oh, we got to stop these people. Get them fighting among themselves. Make them love possessors of houses and lands. Let them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ and his kingdom. And the devil said, for this, we will have them. And, you know, the work is done in sacrifice. A lot of people here at Heartland do it in sacrifice. Some of the members in other churches say, ah, Heartland this, Heartland that. Let me tell you something. You can knock, you, people always knock the truth. But for some reason, they love error. They have itching ears. They want things to tickle their fancy. They want to live in sin. They don't want to overcome. They want somebody to keep giving them plausible messages. We're not here for plausible messages. We're not here to play games. We're in a life and death situation. The drama of the ages is unfolding around us. The beast and his image is rising on the scene. The Pope, the papacy is seeking his teeth in America. And we're walking around here talking about we want pleasing messages now. The Protestants are reached across the Gulf. Spiritualism is sweeping the world. And the devil is about to do his marvelous work. The crowning act in the drama is about to take place and God's people are walking around saying we want itch we have itching ears let us eat drink and be merry for tomorrow shall be as this day and the next day much more abundant let us eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we shall die Die in your sins. Die with your name not on the books or the re in the record. Die with Jesus rejecting you in the investigative judgment. Die because you didn't want to conform all the way to the standard of Christ's righteousness. You didn't want to reflect his image. You didn't want to carry the gospel. You wanted things your way. Yes, did die, you will. Die spiritually, you will die. And yes, you will die a second time too. Oh, yes, you will. And you will join the devil and his angels in the lake of fire. A fire that's so hot, it strikes like lightning. You better go back and study fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone means the place where lightning has struck and the smell of brimstone sulfur is in the air. And it refers to lightning that strikes you in the midst of your head where sin has had its seat in your will and it burns you inside out. That's why Zechariah says that men's eyes consume in their sockets while they stand on their feet. God is not plain because he told Lucifer, I'm going to cause a fire to come from the midst of thee. And if you look up the word midst in the Hebrew, it refers to the mind, the seat of the intellect, that massive intellect of that great angel who went against God. God says, I'm going to cause a fire that's so hot, man, I'm going to burn you inside out. You're not going to be nothing. Your caucus is going to be ashes when I finish with you. God means what he says. And for every Seventh-day Adventist, we will burn with him. Our caucus will be ashes too. And the righteous who received the Christ righteous, who carried this message, they will walk upon the ashes of the wicked. You better watch it. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants you to be prepared for what's coming upon this world. And so he asks us to carry the gospel. But in 2 Timothy 3, 5, we have a contrast to this. The Bible says, having the form of godliness, but denying the power from such turn away. You mean to tell me that if I was a, if I was a really believe the Bible, I'm supposed, y'all folk, you folk are turning away from other things, but the Bible said if I find that you have a form of godliness, the Bible said if I find that you do not carry this message, the Bible said if I find that you are not justified and you're not living, trying to live a sanctified life, the Bible said if I find you're selfish and, and, you, and you really don't want to do God's will but play games in church, the Bible says I'm supposed to turn away from you. Because I myself become, like the Bible says, the evil servants are saying in his heart, my Lord, delay if his coming, and begin to smite and, drink, and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in an hour when he think not. It's not talking about the second coming, folk. It's talking about the investigative judgment. He'll come in an hour when you think not. Malachi said he will come suddenly to his temple. Hello now. Not only the temple in heaven, we know that, but he will come suddenly to those bodies who are supposed to be the temple of his Holy Ghost. And how will it be in that day? Whoa, there, Matthew says there'll be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. I hope not, not for you and not for me. I don't plan to gnash my teeth. I plan to rejoice and say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. But now I want to share something else with you because the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. But you've got to have a connection. 
Do you have prayer? Do you have Bible study? Did you have prayer and Bible study this morning? Or did you just eat breakfast? What did you do this morning, huh? Did you get on your knees? Did you confess your sins before you went to bed last night? Did you make sure everything was right with God? Had you died in your sleep from overeating, would you have lived? What was your condition, huh? Are you prepared for what's coming? Are you studying or are you depending on others? Are you saying, give me your oil and others are being so gullible, they're giving you their oil and neither one of you have oil when the time comes for the loud cry to be given? And where you stand, oh, my husband studies, he does everything right, wrong. You better study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need of not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what the deal is too today? A lot of us get out witnessing and we don't make straight cuts. The word rightly dividing means to make a straight cut. It means don't beat around the bush. It means to make a straight cut. My mother used to have me out there with a sickle cutting weeds. And I remember when the blade of the sickle got dull, I'd be out there chopping all day long. And then my father would come and, and, and sharpen that sickle. And next thing you know, I could, make a, I could take that sling blade and with a straight cut, take the weeds right off the ground. And, then, and the Bible says that we should be making straight cuts. We are not to beat around the bush. We are not to give an uncertain sound of the trumpet when it comes down to this message, ladies and gentlemen. If somebody asks you what you are, you don't be running around beating around. The bush. Well, 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 maybe I think I'm a, I think I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. No, no, I think I'm. No. You say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And do, do you, why do you eat meat? Uh, why you don't eat meat? Well, because number one, my body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, any man defile the body, him God will destroy. I mean, you need to just go on and tell people like it is and stop and give them a thus to the Lord. Don't give them your opinions. One of the biggest problems why we won't witness is because we give our opinions. We don't know the word. Jesus met the devil with the word. How do you meet the devil? With logic, right? Yeah, well, Satan, I won't do that because you, you're not going to get me on that. And the devil said, no, nah, but I won't get you on that, but I'll get you on this one here because you don't know the word no way. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, do you know the word? That's what the Bible is getting at. John 17, 17 said you must be sanctified through the truth. That means you got to live it. One of us won't. Sometimes we won't witness because we won't live it. We will not go out because we know we're mistreating our wives and family and our children. But yet we like the form. We like to, uh, we like to assume the ornamentation of the sanctuary, but we don't want to be sanctified in the sanctuary. Ellen White said, those who assume the ornamentation of the sanctuary, they will soon be taken out. Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm going to move your candlestick. Oh, yes, right, Laodicean, you keep on staying there. Because Laodicean is full of pride. They're full of self. They're full of, they're full of self-worth. I'm, I'm important. You're nothing. You're ashes. That's right. We're dust and clay and we're ashes. And without the power of Christ, without the blood that Jesus shed, we are never alive. We're living dead. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants you to be prepared, but you got to have a living connection. Why did I ask you about prayer and Bible study? Because without prayer and Bible study, you can't have a connection. Without prayer and Bible study, you won't be connected to witness. Without prayer and Bible study, you go out in the field, and you can't stand being out there. You just can't wait to get home. Oh, well, how long we go? You know the church. You know how the church do. We're going to have a witnessing day on Sabbath. Everybody says, well, what church? Who's going to be preaching next week? Oh, so-and-so going to preach. We're going to have, oh, I'm going over to that church over there because see, they're going to have witnessing over here. I, I don't want to be bothered with that. You know, we, we skip and go to other church. Oh, you, you don't know what I'm talking about. It's strange, right? No, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about this because I want to be practical with you. Either you're going to witness and allow God to transform your life so you can maintain witnessing and working for saving souls, or you're not. It's not an option. When a man and woman is truly born again, you do not have to beg them to witness. When a man has his first love for Jesus Christ, he will go out, he will do everything he can to go after his fellow man. You don't have to pre prompting him, giving him little 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 tokens that you that he's doing a good job. That man is looking at Jesus, that woman is looking at Jesus and what Jesus Christ has done for them, and Jesus alone, and they say, Well, if Jesus wants me to go, I'll go, and you don't have to do it. It's I am always amazed when I see a new convert who loves Jesus. Because you don't have to tell them anything. They are already telling their family members about the Sabbath. They are already telling their family members, don't, don't keep going to church on Sunday. They even though the family members don't like it, they are already running around doing the very things they ought to do. And they're they making it right with their brothers. When they, they say, my mother, I hated my mother, I hated my father. You should hear the testimony sometime. And yet they'll come back and they'll say, but I praise God. He taught me how to love my mother and taught me how to love my father. And the father and mother may be dying. And all of a sudden they said they got it right with God before the person died. It's amazing what people do when they're truly converted. I'm talking about true conversion here. The Bible said, be 
live being born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, who's liveth and abideth forever. If you're born again, the word of God will be in your heart. Amen. That word have I hid in my heart that I might not with everybody. Sin against thee. Does the word of God do you hide in your heart? Do you sit down and memorize scripture? Do you put the word of God here? Do you have a living connection? Do you pray, Lord, teach me your word, show me thy way, and thy and, and David and get like David, Lord, you have taught me better than all my teachers? Do you sit down in the school of hard knocks with Christ? Where is your faith today? Just when the Son of Man come, will he have fine faith on the earth? Huh? Where's the kind of faith do you have? Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Are you hearing the word of God every day? Or are you only reading a devotional volume and then say, well, we had devotion today, that was good enough. No, that was not good enough. If you had that type of breakfast, you're going to be malnourished in just a little while. You need a full meal. Ellen White said your dinner should be in the, your heaviest meal should be in the morning. Hello, yes, your heaviest meal should be in the morning. Your heaviest spiritual meal ought to be in the morning too. Because you're going to go throughout the day dealing with problems, difficulties, trials, people on the job, hard heads, all type of personalities, and you need help. And you need fortification. And God's word only can give you that fortification that you need. But does the word of God dwell in you richly? How well do you know the Bible? Huh? If somebody says today I'm an atheist, what do you say to him? Well, sir, well, if you're going to be an atheist, no, you go to Psalm 14, 1, it says a fool has said in his heart there is no God. You call me a fool? No, the Bible did. Well, if, uh, I'm asking you today, how well you know your Bible? I'm talking about witnessing. We're going to get into witnessing here. I'm going to share experiences, but I just want to know. How well do you know your Bible? Are you prepared when the people come to you and say, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost? What do you tell them? Huh? You sit there and argue with them, or do you let them know from the Bible? Thus said the Lord, sanctification comes through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You can't be practicing all truth because you're only keeping nine of the commandments. So therefore, you can't be sanctified. And smile with them and love them and say, uh, you can't be sanctified. Oh, you can't be sanctified. And what about this? Do you Adventists have the Holy Ghost? Oh, sure. Don't try to jump up and down like we do and everything else, huh? No, we don't jump up and down. We believe the Holy Spirit is, as a, is, is, a, is, a, is the third person of the Godhead, and we believe God wants intelligent men and women. We believe that God's Holy Spirit is a teacher, first of all. We believe that he indwells in our heart by faith. We don't have to go by feelings. We walk by faith and not by sight. We believe that the Holy Spirit, when he comes in life, he transforms us. St. Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, what, everybody? All things become what? New. That's how I got the Holy Ghost. When somebody asks you in a Pentecostal church, you have the Holy Ghost, don't sit there saying, well, I think I knew. No, you say, yes, I have the Holy Ghost. How do you know you got the Holy Ghost? I asked God this morning for the Holy Ghost. Luke eleven thirteen 13 said, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit them that ask him? I ask God, I got it. Well, do you speak in tongue? No. Tongues are sign for unbelievers. You calling me an unbeliever? Yes, I am. Because you don't believe that God has given you a written revelation of his word now, and tongues is not a necessary sign. It was a sign for the unbelievers back then because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. When the, river, when the written revelation of Jesus Christ would come, then Paul said then that, that tongues would not be necessary. Hello? I'm talking about how to meet objections in the field. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Jehovah's Witness. Oh, hi. Uh, you, you, we believe in God. Well, no. Do you believe in Jesus Christ being the Son of God? No, we believe in a God. No, sister. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Well, we believe in a God. No. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Well, he's a God. If he's a God, then he's a demigod. If he's a demigod, he's a false God. If he's a false God, then he can't be your God, and he can't be my God, and you are, you are not Jehovah's Witness, because there's no salvation through no other person but Jesus Christ. And if he's only a man, then you in sin, and we all in sin, and he's in sin. I'm talking about how you deal with people in the, in the field. Amen. You right, got the Rossifarians sit there. Hello, my brother, how would you mind? We go back and we believe in Haley Selassie, man. Talk to me like that. I said, you do. I said, Haley's been dead a long time. <laughs> he said, what? I said, yes, Haley Selassie's been dead a long time. I said, not only that, you know, Haley talking about, Haley smoked a lot of marijuana, brain messed up, you know, body was never the temple of the Holy Ghost. He was never born again. Guy came to me one day, I was teaching, I used to be a martial art instructor, and the guy came to me and says, uh, we, Buddha, you know, he came talking to me about Buddha and all that other stuff. I said, man, let me tell you something, Buddha's a nice big fat statue, but he dead. <laughs> I told him, just like that, I said, he's dead. I said, you got that? He said, but you used to believe in Buddha. I said, no, I never believed in Buddha, but I liked the martial arts, so I wouldn't have joined that, but I never believed in Buddha. I believed in Jesus Christ all along. 
See, when y'all did your meditation and prayer and you tell me to go down and pray, he said, yeah, yeah. I said, I used to put my hands together and pray to Jesus even though I didn't know that much about him. He said, oh, if we'd known that, we would never have taught you. I said, well, too late. <laughs> I'm just sharing with you for a moment the importance of knowing what we believe. And that was before I became an Adventist, by the way. I want to make sure you get that on record. But let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. God wants you to have experiences, a living connection. I'm going to share some experience with you now because I want to talk about, I'm talking about this angel of Revelation 14 and how time will be, time will be no more when we all have a living connection with God and carry this message like we should. Time will be no more when we get to the point when we have nothing else on our mind but the saving of our souls and the souls of others. We will bring time to an end. You see, time was no more when the investigative judgments began in 1844. No more time setting. Some people are sitting there saying, well, what's going to happen in the year 2000? I don't know what's going to happen by the year 2000. The Bible says you ought to pray, if it be God's will, you live to see tomorrow. You're worrying about the year 2000? You better worry about tomorrow, if anything, or today. For today is all you have. The Bible tells us, you know, you, you say, well, I'm worried about my clothes. If I, if, I, if I give my heart to Jesus and go out there and do that missionary work, I won't have no job. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They tore not, neither they spin. But I said to you, Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus said, I'll take care of you. Oh, brother, that's impossible. See, I got a good job. See, you don't understand, you don't understand, son. See, I make, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I work for a big car company, I'm making good money. You can't tell me, God, yes, I am telling you, the Bible says this, if any man wants to do God's will, he said, he shall know the doctrine will be of God, or will I speak of myself. Jesus said in John 7, 7, he said, let that man pick up his cross and follow me. When the rich young ruler came to me, what did he tell him? He said, well, master, I, I follow you, uh, master, you know, Jesus looked at him and said, look, uh, go sell all you have, give the poor, and follow me, and you shall have riches in heaven. Desire of Ages says in the book Christ, Object Lesson says, and at that, the man, young man turned away sorrowfully. He couldn't handle that. He had selfishness in the heart. He couldn't get rid of it. Christ is testing you on the same thing. It doesn't make any sense that people talk about carport work, and the carport work seems to be dead. Why is it dead? Because the people of God does not take the work serious. They don't look at it in the light of the cross. They look at it in the light of dollars and cents. If I can make money with it, then I'll do it. It was never meant for you to make a lot of money with it and become a millionaire or whatever, even though God will bless you above all that you can actually think according to the power that worketh in you. Amen. Amen. Amen? He wants you to understand that. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is trying to call, God is Jesus is calling you to witness. But don't, you can't be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Why are you afraid? Isaiah 41 10 says, Fear not, for I am with thee, and be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Why are we living in fear? Why are we petrified to go out and witness? Why can't we just get on fire for God and stay on fire? Why can't the Holy Spirit pull us up out of our seat and take us on? Why aren't we willing to do all we can to save souls? People are perishing. Have you read the newspapers lately? Have you heard about the plane crashes? Have you heard about the, tor the, the, the tornadoes? Have you heard about the floods? Have you heard about the graveyards overflowing? Have you heard about the funeral homes? Have you been in the ambulance wars in the hospitals lately? Have you seen the suicide rate in America? Have you seen the nations in angry today? Can you see the miracle working powers of demons bent on destruction? What has to wake you up to know that God is calling you to witness at this time? All these things are going on, and yet we won't witness. And yet, at the same time, you've got to have a living connection. I'm going to, go into a door, knocking on a door in the cold. Pardon me, ma'am. My name is Maurice Berry. I'm from the Family Health Education Service, and my call is of special importance to view the many problems that we're facing in our world. You wouldn't mind if I explain for just a few moments. The lady said, go away. She said, what you doing out here in below zero weather? I said, ma'am, I'm out here in below zero weather because I have a message for you. I don't want anything. I said, okay, ma'am, you mind if I have a word of prayer? Go on and pray. Prayed at the door. She says, you out here in the cold, you know it's cold out here? I said, yes, I know it's cold. She said, what do you have, what do you have? I said, ma'am, I'm in my bag. I said, I'm gonna talk about, talk to you just for a moment. I said, behold, here an image. An image that foretells the end of time. God foretold the end of time an image of a man whose head was of gold. His breast and arms of silver, his waist and belly of brass and legs of iron, feet part iron, part clay. 
Here God has described the rise and fall of nations and empires and how we're now living in the very toenails of time. She said, stop, I dreamed about the foot in that image. I said, what? She said, yes. She said, I dreamed about the foot. She said, for three and a half years, I've been wanting to know the meaning of my dream. She said, will you tell me the meaning of this dream? I said, first of all, the Bible said to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to his word, it's because there's no light in it. Tell me the symbols of your dream. She said, I dreamed I saw this foot. She said, I heard a voice from heaven said, soon I will come and grind you to powder. She said, I woke up in terror and horrified. She said, I've been to the Methodists, I've been to the Baptists, I've been to the Jehovah's Witnesses, I've been to the Pentecostals. And she said, none of them can tell me the meaning of the dream. She said, can you? I said, of course I can. She said, really? I said, yes. I said, to the law and to the testimony. The law meaning that, that, that everything must be in harmony with the first five books of Moses and the testimony of scripture from the prophets on down to the Old and New Testament. And she says, oh, okay. And I said to her, I said, first of all, this is the meaning of your dream. I said, the feet of iron and clay represent the nations of the last day, partly strong and partly broken, churchcraft and statecraft. I said, you also heard in your dream the voice of a holy watcher giving you a decree and a warning, saying, soon I will come. And in the dream, he said, I'll grind you to powder. Jesus said, whosoever shall fall upon the rock and be broken, the same shall be saved. But whosoever the son of man, whosoever the rock shall fall upon, it shall grind him to powder. Madam, I said, if you're not ready when Jesus comes again, if you don't make your salvation sure and your eternal life sure now, the Bible says that you're going to be struck down by the glory of God, by the brightness, and you're going to be struck even with the ground. In a sense, ma'am, you're going to be ground to powder. She said, that's the meaning of my dream. She said, that's to me. How much is that book? I said, this book is $39.95. She said, wait just a minute. Went in the back room, pulled out a handkerchief, had a little sock in it. She said, I've saved this for a rainy day. I said, this, she's, and I said, this is the rainy day right here. And she went on to turn around and bought the book. But I'm telling you what the people, what, what, what was going on. Went to another place. Knocked on the door. Man said, come in. I'm talking about why you got to have a living connection. When I say living connection, you ought to be up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Hello. You ought to spend time on your knees with God, surrendering first, getting rid of self, selfishness, the flesh, and the devil, and then praying for your soul and others. And when you do that, God's going to give you a connection, and you're going to have experiences that you've never had before. You won't be an average pew member anymore. You won't be an average uh, 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 lay of the sea in seven-day Adventist. You're going to be on fire because you cannot have a connection with God. You cannot touch fire and not get burned. Hello, and God is, God's glory is a consuming fire. The character of Christ is a consuming fire. Every time you try to be like Christ, he burns away that worldliness, burns away all the dross that's in your life and helps you become fitted and hewed and square for a square city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. I want you to know that God's going to be with you, but you need to be up because you're going to have experiences in spiritualism. I knocked on the door. Man said, come on in. And I walked in, and the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you what I know, the Holy Spirit said, don't sit down. I walked in the door. I didn't pay attention. I looked, and when, I went up, when I walked in the door, I heard the locks going. He had five locks on the door, and he locked all of them. And I stood around, and I didn't know why the man was. And when I turned around, the man had no clothes on. And he starts switching towards me, saying, now, what do you want? I realized it wasn't time for a sales talk or a canvas. It was time, as they would say, to get real. He done locked the doors. I'm in here and I'm praying because I can't depend on self. I can't use my martial arts skills and say, Lord, if he touch me, I'll break out. No, you can't do that now. Only thing I can do is get rid of self right quick and depend on Jesus. Hello. That's right, because the Bible says in Psalms 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamp about them that fear him, and it's near to the liver. I said, Lord, where are they? Their ministry spirit sent forth to minister those who to be heirs of salvation. I said, send them 10,000 times 10,000. You said every angel in church would come to my aid if before I'm overcome by the devil. You said every angel in heaven. I said, send them now, Lord. I need them now. <laughs> and that guy came up to me and he said, now, what do you want? And I said, I said, sir, I'm here to tell you that God loves you, but he hates your sin, and he wants you to repent. Oh, you dare come in my house and tell me to repent who do you think you are and they said you wait here wait here while I was sitting there waiting I was praying he went in the back room I thought I was going to put some clothes on he came back out with a black cape on I said Lord have mercy I didn't sing it all now and he came he had fingernails painted red dripping and he stood there and he looked at me and he said look me in my eye it's important to be fortified 
It's important in Isaiah 26, 3, the Bible said, Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, for he trusted thee. And Philippians 4, it says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in what? Christ Jesus. Hello? Casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing every thought into captivity to the will of God. It's important, folk. These are not just suggestions God's giving you. You're going to need them out here in the field. You're in warfare. Yeah, right. And that man told me, he said, look here. He said, let me tell you something. Look at me in the eye. I looked that man in the eye, and as I was looking him in the eye, he started going, and when he was going, all thing I could say in my mind was Jesus. 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 I, and Ellen White said, there's power in the name. Hello? Power in the name. And I said, Jesus, like that. And that man said, ah! He said, I can't see. I can't see. And he was walking around the room like that. And I got brave then. I said, oh, man. Galatians 2.20 came to me. I said, sir, I said, I want to tell you something. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. But Christ that now lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I said, remember what I told you. God loves you. He hates your sin. And have a good day. And while he was stumbling around on the couch, I went there and unlocked the locks on his door as quick as I could and took my case and walked out of his house. I'm telling you what holy angels do when God is with you. I know what God will do. I'm telling you what God will do. Then I'm sitting there, I'm going, I'm going into another house, knocked on the door, the lady said, my, have a, my daughter has a contagious disease, and if you walk in, you'll catch it. I said, no, I won't. The Bible said the curse causes shall not come. What am I doing? Every home I'm going to, when they give me an objection, what am I meeting them with? With the word of God. The word of God must be in the heart. Come on now. And you're going out with us. I'm the angel of Revelation 14. Nothing shall come upon me if I keep God's commandments. Hello. No man shall stand before me all the days of my life if I'm walking with Jesus like I should. The Bible told Joshua, the Lord told Joshua, meditate on the book of the law. Observe do all that's in it. And no man will stand before you all the days of your life. I believe that promise. I had, a, I, had a, I had a publishing director named uh, 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 Sandy Robinson who used to teach us over and over that no man will stand before you all the days of your life if you do all that you're supposed to do in the call for the work. And I remembered that. And I was in this particular home. The lady said, my daughter got contagious, contagious disease. And I was sitting there talking to her. And the, man, the lady said to me, well, you're going to catch it if you come in here. I said, ma'am, the curse causes shall not come. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. She said, well, Jesus said, come on in. She let me in the house, and she said, you're going to catch it. I pulled out by reading for the home. I began to talk about here the second coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, because, see, when you go out in the field, ladies and gentlemen, you want to, you want to, you want to be on fire for God. Your whole idea is not just to go out there and sell a book. You're going to give a message. These are message books. Hello. You're the angel, Urgent 14. God says, you need some help. I'm going to give you some call porter books to carry out in the field so you won't forget how to carry the message, and you won't forget what to say when you're going home. Oh, y'all just don't get it, do you? Boy, you just don't get it. This is, this, is, this is rich, folk. Because when you go in the home, Jesus has you in the home. And what are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about the, the soap operas that they're watching on TV? You're going to talk about the sports event that they're watching now? Or you're going to take their mind off of worldly dreaming? And you're going to take them to the real issues, the end of the world? Mrs. Johnson, do you know what's getting ready to happen on this world? Let me tell you what the Bible says. In Luke 21, verse 25 and 26, there shall come upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves will be roaring. Men's hearts shall fail them for fear. And for looking after those things coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Miss Johnson, what's next in our world? Crime and violence is all over the land. But one thing is certain. The Bible says, he that shall come will come and shall not tarry. All the signs of the time show that Jesus is coming again. Matthew 24, 30 says, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh in clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Johnson, Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Coming again. Jesus is coming again. You need to be ready. How about that, Mrs. Johnson? I'll be here all day telling you about the service. But you can get it today. Donation to this, donation prices on the back. We're supposed to be giving a message. You know why? Because if you leave that house and that person didn't get a message, guess what happens? God holds you accountable. Because if they don't even buy the book, they're supposed to be able to say, well, they can't stand before God in judgment and say they didn't get warned. That you wasn't a witness. Oh, yes, and what about this one here? Great controversy, huh? Oh, boy, secret weapon, top secret. Nuclear bomb. I told you we had missiles, didn't I? This is one of them right here. Boy, when you drop this book in the right place, boy, it hits a, it hits a sore spot. I went into church about two weeks ago. I had some of the students with me from Heartland. Yes, we're busy here. I don't know about other places, but we're busy here. Are we busy, young men and women here? Amen? Amen. Yes, I have my friends everywhere. I want y'all to know that. 
They all over the place. So all these are my soldiers. These are, this is my troop here. Right, Melbourne? Yes. All right, right? Conway over here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, uh, John? Yes, okay. John even comes overseas to help us. All right, I want you to know that. But then I want you to know something here. The book, Great Controversy. How do you, how you talk about it? Some of us are scared to talk about it because we can't prove the writings we say of Ellen White. You can prove them all if you study the Bible like you should. But I want to say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. When you go in the house, this is a bomb. But this is the bomb that the people need. The new world order is about to take place. The fulfillment, the judgment is about to be over. The beast and his image is on the sea, on the land, about to attack. America is reached across the Gulf. We should be carrying this book, and we should not fear the consequences, nor be ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This book is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you go in the house and you get to talking about it, you say, Miss Johnson, this volume begins where the Bible ends and tells the story of the great conflict between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And whoa, what a story it is. This will help you to understand here the work on reform. It will help you understand here the snares of Satan. Ellen White says there's nothing Satan fears most, and people will understand how he deceives them. And this book unloose, unravels those snares. And then it talks about, can the dead speak to us? And liberty of conscience, will America always be the land of the free and the home of the brave? Mrs. Jones, this will help you to understand that America, this it was once innocent lamb, is soon to speak as a dragon. Soon the image of the beast will be formed. This will help you understand, what, are we living in a time of the investigative judgment? What about it, Mrs. Johnson, the impending conflict? What's next on the scene? Many thinking people want to know what the future holds. This volume tells about past, present, and future future and it helps us understand the history of the early Christian church not only that this volume is worth its weight in silver and gold and it will help you understand that final conflict when God's people shall be delivered everyone whose name shall be found written in the book of life and when you go in the home, you tell them about the plagues. You let, you let them know. Ellen White says we must call people's attention to the most important chapters of this book. We are to bring them face to face, mind to mind, heart to heart with the truth. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, God was going to bless us. He's going to bless you. But i got to close now. And I tell you, I'm going to close telling the story, Carl Porter story, why it's so important that you could try to Try, even if you got to beg the people sometimes because they don't know what they they don't know what they're turning down they had a young man his name was Herman Herman's mother had just passed and he was feeling sad and Herman decided that his mother told him Herman I want you to get close to God and I want you to learn about learn God's will for your life that was her last words to Herman before she died. Herman's mother had died two weeks before we met him. And he had told us as we walked in the home, I, we showed him by reading for the home, and Herman said, I want to get that book because my mother told me I should get close to God. The mother, the Lord had used his mother to prepare him to receive the book. But Herman had one problem, he had a girlfriend. And the girlfriend would always stand in the way of him getting the book. When the time came to deliver the book, the girlfriend came to the door and said, what do you want? I said, well, we've got Herman's book here. He told us to bring it today. Oh, he don't want that book. He's not here. And we heard Herman in the background say, hey, honey, who is at the door? She said, nobody. Look just straight in the face. Devil's agent to, to the max. But guess what happened? We went there again, and Herman wasn't home. One day, the girlfriend got a check in the mail. And she didn't like the amount of money that she got, so she threw the check down, and one of the guys on the porch that she was talking to that particular day picked up the check and said, I'm going to keep it. She getting, got mad and went home and told Herman, that guy got my check and he won't give it to me. Herman went in the back room and got a sawed-off shotgun, came outside, took the shotgun and held it up in the guy's face and said, man, if you don't give my woman her death check, I'm going to blow your head off. The guy said, man, Herman, you shouldn't do this, man. I, I was going to give her the check. I'm just playing. But no, you gonna do this to me, man? Okay. Here. Herman thought it was over. Everybody was quiet. We were still trying to get Herman. We didn't know that happened. A day later, a little boy came knocking on Herman's door that morning, the day he was supposed to get his books. We were supposed to come that afternoon. When we got there, we heard a sad story of a little boy who knocked on the door and told Herman that somebody wanted to see him and he needed to come outside. The little boy didn't know. He just was honestly doing what he was told. But behind the oak tree that Herman had in front of his house, 
The young man who had held the gun in his face had a sawed-off shotgun hiding behind the oak tree. And when Herman stepped off the porch and the young boy had cleared past him, the young man ran up in Herman's face with the shot shotgun straight in his face and blasted his head off. And the people in the community kept saying, why did he get killed so viciously? And they couldn't understand. And they asked me, one lady asked me, why did he get killed so viciously? I said, because Herman was about to follow Jesus. And the devil knew it and decided that he was going to blow Herman's head off. And he killed Herman. But I believe that Herman's mind had been made up. But I'm telling you, there are people like that who are being killed on the verge of hearing the message or receiving the truth. And it's up to you and I to carry it, folks. And I can sit here and tell you more experiences, but that, uh, but my time is up. But I just want to say to you, too, you need to look at Jesus. Have you took a good look at Calvary lately? Yes, you've heard good sermons this weekend. And yes, many of you going back to your jobs and to your homes. And some of you going back to churches where the missionary labor is languishing. Are you going to continue to have a reason to let it languish or will you go back and get active? Will you go back and make up your mind you want to be a soul winner? That God has called me in this church to win souls, not sit here and argue with people over things that I already know. God has sent me in this church to teach people the truth. I would urge you today to please take a good look at Jesus. Look at him stretched out on Calvary. See his eyes bent down with the weight of sin. See the crown of thorns on his brow. See the nail print hands in his, and in his feet, the nails in his feet. Look at his back marred more than any man. Look at his, 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 his very beard plucked from his face. Look at him, look at the tears streaming down his cheeks as he dies of a broken heart. And think about the fact that Jesus thought about you the whole time he was dying. He thought about me. He, he, one day before he would die on Calvary, him and the Father went into councils of light and they looked, peered down through the future and time and came down to the year 1997 and this heartland meeting. And Jesus would see that through his death on Calvary and through his atoning work and atonement that he's complete doing in the sanctuary above, that there would be a group of people a nucleus of people who would hear the message and be carrying the message and trying to push the reforms that are needed, trying to push the proper way of doing missionary work, trying to urge the people on to carry the gospel and that the Advent people can walk higher above the world and not be in the world, be in the world, but not of the world. And they saw it. And Jesus said, Father, I'll go down and die. That that can be possible. And he thought he took you and I into account that day. And so I would like to say, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that you will help us take into account Jesus and the great plan of salvation. For all the great plan of salvation is in a simple term is one person telling another person about the wonderful love of Jesus how he saved them, transformed them, gave them strength and sanctified them to live in harmony with God's will and keep his commandments. Oh Lord, please give us a new vision. Give us a living connection. And Lord, by us carrying this message and thousands of voices being heard all over the world, then soon, time, probationary time for this planet will be no more. Until then, Lord, help us to carry this message. In Jesus' name, amen.